I should give a tutorial uh, on this subject, which is very broad. And instead of trying to show you that there's a lot of activity going on in this, uh, this part of the field, I will try to focus down uh, to a very specific measurement, which you already see here. And I will try to explain this as well, so that you might take home a little bit uh, the difficulties and the, the, the possibilities of these kind of systems. Before I start, I would like to give you a small overview of all what you could do in this field using this kind of systems which I'm going to present. Uh, so uh, so uh, we are now in magnetic molecules, so we discuss a lot of uh, non-magnetic things. Here we are in magnetic molecules. And uh, uh, this field of, sometimes it's called single molecule magnet field, uh, is quite large. So there's a lot of chemists working more than 20 years. I've, they have been working on a lot of different molecules. And here I show you a very small subspace of, of molecules which I personally studied myself. So, uh, so why, why we use these kind of molecules? So the first thing is that uh, as a physicist, there's a huge variety of uh, rather cheap identical uh, objects. So magnetic objects, molecules, uh, which, uh, which has a lot of nice physics inside, which, uh, which uh, revealed to be uh, studied. Huh? So, uh, so because there are many chemists for physicists, it's cheap. You just ask the chemist. They're always happy to collaborate with you. Uh, so you can have very simple systems with just one radical up to very complicated systems with uh, astronomic large Hilbert spaces. So here in terms of spin ground states, uh, these are the numbers what you can get. But uh, Hilbert space can be much more rich than just uh, the ground state uh, spin. Uh, the chemists, they can tune the magnetic anisotropy of these systems. This means that they can tune the energy spacings of your system. So when you're a physicist who likes to have a nice Hilbert space, where you control the levels, the energy levels, uh, so the chemist can tune this by tuning what we call the magnetic anisotropy. So that's a very important tool. Uh, you can do this by using spin-orbit, like systems where spin orbit coupling is large, but you can also avoid this depending on what you want to focus in. You can avoid spin orbit coupling or you can enhance it uh, depending how you want to talk to, to your system. You have nuclear spins in these systems. Uh, most of the time when you make uh, stuff like quantum technologies, you, you're a little bit annoyed about nuclear spins. But in this talk, you will see that we use the nuclear spins and most of the time it's not really the trouble maker yet. We have other troubles, you will see, <laughs> but the nuclear spin is not a troublemaker and you will see that uh, the main talk is about one nuclear spin, which is nice. So uh, the properties, um, in terms of physical properties, quantum properties, you can have tunneling between different quantum states, which has been studied in detail by many groups. You can get quantum interference, which is a nice fancy thing for physicists, or quantum coherence. Uh, and uh, all these keywords, uh, they summarize a huge activity which I won't uh, present you in detail here. I want to squeeze this down to two numbers. So uh, one number, the, we call this T1. So the T1 tells you how long uh, such a spin is stable in a state. And uh, the system at low temperature, they can be very stable. So you can get T1s which are very long, and this in respect to other quantum technologies, this is a really uh, um, an important feature. And with the same system, maybe not exactly in the same condition, uh, you can get also T2s uh, which are long. And T2s uh, uh, give you the time how long you can uh, somewhere keep a certain quantum information, a quantum phase, you're going to see what I mean with this in the talk. Uh, how long you can keep this in the molecule before it's defaced by the environment. So milliseconds is something quite nice. It can rival things like uh, NV centers, for example. Uh, so, uh, um, so these systems are, have nice uh, coherent properties. You can organize these molecules on surfaces. We have discussed junctions, but uh, uh, there's a huge community of people who try to put these molecules on surfaces and then talking to the spin. 
there is not yet too much done to, uh, concerning talking to the spin, but it's going to happen soon because the SCM community, they, uh, they want to go enter into in this field of, of quantum manipulations in our spin systems. So, so there is going to, I expect a lot which is going to come. You can couple these systems in different ways. So here is, is the most simple uh, coupling. It's just via ligands, the chemists can couple the system. Uh, so you get, get some, some kind of exchange coupling. Um, the chemist can switch these couplings uh, with, uh, with light, for example, when they send an electron or they deplace an electron and then, uh, and then they couple or decouple systems. You can switch this uh, uh, via mechanical uh, degrees of freedoms, for example. You, go, you have a lot of ways to switch them and chemists, can, they can make arrays, they can make really organized uh, small uh, systems which, uh, well, which are waiting for, for being studied by physicists. There's a, a lot of stuff going on for quantum uh, devices where you take a, a molecule, you put it in a device and then you study this. I, again, I don't want to go all over all what is going on here. Here's a nice review article of Herre and, uh, and here you find most of the groups who who are working in this field. So, uh, so yeah, so I will just refer to this. And lastly, I want to point out that this field is full of predictions. So, uh, so um, theorists started around this time and they predict a lot of nice stuff, which uh, most of the stuff is not yet uh, shown experimentally. So uh, there's a lot of stuff which you can do. And here again, there's a review article uh, of these guys, uh, Marco, who is here. Uh, and this real article should give you all the different references which you, which you see um, which are in this field. So uh, there's a lot to be done uh, and it can be quite fancy like what this scheme should uh, uh, tell you here. And uh, so in the following, I don't want to confuse you completely. So I would like to go down to just one molecule and try to show you this one molecule, how far we can go at that stage, where are our troubles. And uh, the talk I organized in, uh, in these following steps here. So we have uh, uh, six steps to come to the real interesting thing for people who are working in quantum technologies. We want to make quantum gates. So some of you are interested only in this part. They, they know this part, but as the community here is a little bit larger, I will show you a little bit uh, how we come to, to real quantum operations in these systems. And I suggest that you interrupt me with questions after all these different steps. Uh, and depending on how many questions you have, we, we, we enter this field here or not. Huh? So this, we have a limited time. So let's start with uh, uh, the first step. And in this first step, I want to present you the key player of this talk. So the key player of this talk is this uh, phthalazanine uh, molecule. The physicist called this a double decker. So we have two ligands here. In the middle, you keep an ion. An ion, and this ion, in, uh, it can be a lot of different ions. Uh, most of the time, there are rare earth, rare earth ions inside. Um, and in this talk, we just focus down to one ion. And this ion is a terbium-3 plus ion. So this very stable ion is known in, phys in physics uh, for a long time, these kind of uh, uh, ions. Uh, and now uh, we, uh, we are focused down to this ion and we try to play with this guy. So for us here, this is chemistry, which just keeps the quantum system at a nice place. Now, if you uh, look at the terbium-3 plus ion and you look at uh, the, the, uh, the the electrons, uh, you, uh, most of the magnetic, uh, magnetic part is in the 4F shell. So uh, in the 4F shell, you have, uh, in this case, uh, uh, seven electrons which are distributed. And with Hund's rule, you find out that, uh, in fact, uh, we have an S equals six ground state of this ion. Now, this S equals six ground state coming from L3, S3, uh, coupled together, uh, uh, this one, this 6-3 in, in space, in vacuum, it would be uh, degenerate. 
Now, this is kept by the chemist, uh, by these lichens. The, uh, the iron is kept. And via this, the fingers on the iron will distort the iron. And it will distort the iron in such a way that this degeneracy of, uh, the, uh, of the J equals 6 ground state is, uh, is lifted very strongly. And in this case, so strongly that we get a nicely isolated ground state where this spin is either up or down. And this ground state is uh, separated so by uh, some energy to excited states. So in this talk, we will skip all the complicated stuff, which is at higher energies. Uh, we are low temperature guys. We go down to millikelvins. So, uh, so all this we will forget now. And for us, this thing is, is boiling down to an easing spin. So we have spin up or spin down. So this is our, our system which we want to study. Now we have to look, look a little bit more careful. So if you look more careful to this iron, you see that your nucleus and the nucleus has a nuclear spin. The nuclear spin for terbium is 3 half. There's only one isotope, uh, 3 half. Now this nuclear spin sees the uh, electronic spin. So this guy here. So this interaction is called hyperfine interaction. And this will make a hyperfine term here, uh, which is quite large for rare, rare earth ions. In addition, to, to this interaction, this hyperfine interaction, the nuclear spin sees also the, the electric field distribution, and this is not homogeneous. And this electric field distribution in, uh, local to the, uh, to the nucleus will give you a quadrupole splitting. So this is this, this term here. So the nuclear spin is happy when it points in a certain directions. It's not isotropic. So this is our hyperfine Hamiltonian. And when you look what happens now when you have this hyperfine Hamiltonian, you apply this hyperfine Hamiltonian to an easing spin, uh, spin up or down. So this will lift the levels of this uh, up and down spin uh, in such a way that the four states of the nuclear spin, they are lifted in energy via these uh, frequencies, or we call these colors. Uh, so we have three different colors to talk to the system. So the, the energies are here different because of the quadrupole splitting. The overall splitting is coming from the hyperfine coupling. But the, the energy difference here is coming from the quadrupole splitting. And so, uh, so this is now in the following our qubit. And because it, had, it has four levels, we will not call it a qubit. Uh, a qubit is always two levels. We will call it a qubit. A Q did D means dimension. So we have here a dimension of four. So we have a Q did of D equals four. And this will be our quantum system. And we want to play as much as possible with uh, this quantum system. And this, the whole talk is going to be on, on this guy. But we will need all the chain, which I just presented you, to come to the nuclear spin. So are you happy at that stage? So this is the key player. Huh? We play with this guy. So now we have to read out the system. So reading out, well, there's a lot of different possibilities. It's not easy. Uh, I started a long time my PhD uh, with uh, microsquids, and we could study nanoparticles and stuff. Uh, they have a sensitivity uh, around this, this number. So this is not enough to study a single nuclear spin. Huh? So these are electronic spins. So we uh, improved this over the years. So the first improvement was uh, were these nanosquids. So here you have a carbon nanotube in the squid ring. And this guy can measure a single molecule, a single electronic spin. There are other possibilities. For example, you can take graphene and etch out a certain device and then study a single molecule. And Marco Afronte, the second speaker, is going to tell you more about this thing. You can take a carbon nanotube. Uh, connect this to source and train, and then put some molecules there. And this, again, is sensitive enough to study single molecules. And uh, uh, now we have new uh, three per persons in the group who are going to continue on this thing. There was some uh, gap of time, but uh, now we continue with these kind of devices. They are also very nice devices to study single molecules. I won't tell you uh, something about this today. We will we'll go to this system, where we squeeze a molecule in a junction, and this is for obvious reasons. We like break junctions. So that's why we discuss this part. 
most here in this talk. So we'll pick out this way of reading out a single molecule. Now, what's the idea behind? So the idea is that I squeeze a molecule with some fancy technique into a source and a drain electrode. I have a gate below, so I have a small transistor. And now I want to send current through the system. Now, I don't want that the current goes through our quantum system. If I would send my current on the terbium 3 plus ion, that means I would oxidize or reduce the ion, this will disturb my quantum system. So this I don't want. Uh, luckily, uh, the terbium 3 plus ion is an ion which is very, very stable. So it's very difficult to reduce or to oxidize this ion. So the terbium 3 plus ion will be always 3 plus. So this won't change. So this electron, when it goes onto the molecule, it will charge the molecule, uh, and this will uh, hinder another electron to go in before the electron can go, can, can go out. So this electron will live somewhere on the ligands. And on the ligands, there are pi pi systems, which, which somewhere uh, will keep these, these electron for a certain time, and then it goes out. So a physicist calls this a quantum dot. Uh, it's just a dot with levels, and I can charge it more or less with electrons. And so you say this is a source and a drain electrode. Fermi energy is here. And then we have here in the middle our quantum dot. It has different levels, uh, depending on the gate. Here you have some gate to tune the levels. So, so this quantum dot we call also readout dot. So most of you are caring about a little bit uh, what's the physics of going through this dot, how are the connections and so on. We don't care so much. We just uh, uh, want a nice quantum dot, which is very stable. That means we have a nicely uh, narrow line here, a nice, uh, a nice energy, and this energy should not uh, jump around. <coughs> Meaning that we don't want uh, charges here, which uh, or other two-level systems which can key, uh, take an electron and then uh, keep it for a longer time and then give the electron uh, back again. This would, would give us charge noise. This we don't want. So we want uh, just a uh, very nice environment where we have somewhere a quantum dot. Now, this quantum dot should somewhere uh, slightly couple to our quantum system, but only slightly. So in this case, uh, there is a small exchange coupling. And uh, while this can be discussed in detail, I won't do it here. Uh, this exchange coupling should be weak. If it's strong, it, uh, again, as soon as an electron goes here in, it will disturb my quantum system. So this I don't want. Uh, I want here a very uh, a weak coupling. Chemists can tune this, huh? depending on how you construct the system, uh, depending on what ligands you put here. It's more, the quantum dots are more or less far away from the system. So this is uh, easy to control. Once you put the molecule in a junction, of course, uh, then it's not really too uh, easy to control. Each system will be different. Each readout dot will be different, uh, but we don't care. We just want an, uh, an, uh, an, is an isolated, uh, stable quantum dot, which we can tune with a gate, and, uh, and then we are happy. So with the gate, we always get the quantum dots uh, in the nice regime. You're going to see this. So here we want a, a small coupling. Now this guy is hyperfan coupled to the, electronic, uh, to the nuclear spin. So what we do now is, is we map this very tiny spin onto a big spin via the hyperfan coupling. This very big spin is influencing a little bit the quantum dot. And this I read out with the source and drain electrode with these Fermi energies here. I see if the energy is uh, slightly shifting. So what I have here is a two-stage amplifier. Uh, so here I amplify, and here I then uh, with this thing I amplify again. But you could see this also quantum mechanically as a two-stage decoupling. My environment, which will annoy my, my quantum system, is here. This is the environment. Uh, so the, this uh, decoherence, which comes from the source and drain, has to go via these couplings to my quantum system and uh, disturb it. So I decouple my quantum system. Are you happy with this? Well, yes? Can you introduce a little bit more how chemically you can decouple it? How, like, from point of view of chemistry? I, I know probably it's easier not to it. Like chemical details. So chemi chemists, they work with orbitals. Huh? So they have some covalent bounds. 
And depending on how you construct the molecule, uh, all this is chemistry, all these bounds, depending on this, you will get here a certain coupling. Uh, so it will depend really on the exact bounds you put here. Um, for our case, as we want a very weak coupling, at the moment we are at the level where nobody can predict these couplings. Huh? So uh, I, I wanted to convince some of the theorists since more than uh, 10 years to, to calculate these couplings. It's too small. Huh? So I want here something which is well below a milli electron volt. A uh, milli electron volt for DFG, uh, DFG is difficult. Huh? So for, uh, for quantum chemists, it's also difficult. So at the moment, we, we want something very weak here. Uh, and it is going to work. You're going to see this. At low temperature, it works well, uh, but it's not easy to predict. And uh, the electrodes, I also can't really control. Uh, you know, break junctions, uh, you know what happens here. These are nice cartoons. Uh, it's not, not so nice in reality. So this we can't control. So each system is going to be different. And uh, the selection I will do is very simple. I want to see a certain physics in my molecule. If I don't see this, I just throw away the device and start with a new one. Uh, so I, I will scan as long as I find exactly what I want to see uh, as physics inside the molecule. And then these measurements will prove that the molecule is intact. Uh, this is the scheme. Uh, so, so it's not a scalable approach. Um, but for a physicist, well, you, you're going to work a bit. And depending on your student, you're more or less lucky. And uh, sometimes it's very fast. Uh, so when we cool down devices, uh, we have 20 devices at the same time. They scan over the 20. And then they don't heat up anymore for two years, uh, up to five years. Uh, because they have a nice device, and then all is, is done. Uh, so it can be very fast. It can be sometimes a little bit longer. Uh, but uh, once we have this system, in our case, we, we set up our experiments so that it's really stable for a long time. Yes? So I have a, a conceptual doubt or about the whole concept of, the, of interfering with the, with the quantum system. Right? You, you want to, to know how the dynamics of this interaction of the spins is, and eventually by putting this current as a probe, even if weakly interacting, how can you know that you are not actually influencing and directing that dynamics of the other interaction you want to check? You're going to see this. Huh? I will show you in a second that our device is not innocent. Huh? So whenever you read out a quantum system, uh, you have to pay a price. And the price you're going to see. Huh? So this will, so you see it immediately in T1, for example. You are going to see that there's a price which is expensive, but uh, the chemists are very good. So we have a lot to, uh, we can lose a lot and we still got. Huh? So yes. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, chemistry, so I have silly questions. What's, what uh, redox state of the molecule do you use? I don't remember. So, um, is it the one? Is it the, uh, so, so this is a, a, a very good chemistry question. For, yeah. for a physicist, you see, we don't care. Huh? We can't really know. Yeah. Uh, we, what we know is we have a quantum dot, and the physicist can tell you if it's an even number of electrons or an odd number of electrons. Uh, this we can show very precisely. But how much its molecule is really charged, we, uh, we don't care. Huh? The reason I ask is when you have the neutral molecule, you have, you have a spin on the ligands themselves. Yes, but with the gate, I can an annihilate this, this, uh, this uh, radical or not. So with the gate, I'm always different. And so the chemists, they send us many different molecules like this. The core is always the same. The outside is different. And then, of course, the, uh, the typical question of the chemist is, do you see a difference? I have to admit, I don't see a difference. Huh? So I, I see a difference between one device and another one. And uh, because often one device is then in the end one student who stays, uh, our record is five years for one, 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 one molecule. So after five years, you don't even remember anymore what vial you took from the chemist. Huh? So, so uh, we know in the end that we have this guy. Uh, and this guy, uh, you will see here, we have no fitting parameters. Once we have this guy and it's a nice environment, we know exactly at this gate an electron is jumping on our device. This we don't want, so avoid this gate. Uh, but in terms of chemistry, we know nothing. Huh? So we know only that we have a nice... This guy we also can check very nicely. So this guy has a nice environment. Uh, and then we can probe this, uh, this guy here. 
uh, but uh, this is completely un uncontrolled. But uh, the success rate is, is quite high uh, once uh, the student know how to make these kind of devices. At the beginning, we, we, we can take quite some time to, to make electrodes. Huh? I don't know if you start a new lab. I had to start a new lab three years ago, and you just had to evaporate gold, huh? a very trivial thing. It can take a long time to get this, uh, depending on what, uh, what the lab you are. Huh? So I'm in a qubit lab where uh, they make superconducting qubits and they forbid gold, gold huh? so you can't put gold in your chambers and then you're messed up. Uh, and so, so just to tell you that uh, there are a lot of troubles, once you solve all the troubles, then normally it's very fast. You have no control about uh, the environment, uh, the, re the real geometry of the system, but as I said, we, we choose, we select the molecules which show us the physics we want on the iron. So uh, all for example, if you would turn one ligand in respect to the other, uh, chemists can do this in a crystal, you see that the ligand field is changing. Uh, there's a lot, lot of stuff changing. Uh, yeah, this you, you can't control. Huh? But you don't care because you only need this as an easing spin. And if it's too strongly disturbed, of course, then uh, the uh, higher states, they come down. So this we don't want, but then we just take another system. Huh? So this guy we want. And this one is always, when if you have terbium, you always have the same guy here. Uh, the hyperfine coupling can again uh, somewhere depend on the ligand field, uh, and this can be studied, but, uh, but again, this is, is not really our focus at that stage. So, experimentally, we, uh, we use electromigration. I don't uh, explain this to you in detail. We just have some gold fingers, we send currents through, we open a gap. Uh, this has been shown many times. You can also break this. The important thing that we have a gate below. So most of the break junctions, they don't have a gate below. We need this gate to find a nice working point. So what we do is simply we open the gap. Uh, most of the time we heat a little bit to 20, 30 Kelvin. A certain point, the molecule diffuses in. And then, uh, then we cool down. And then uh, we see something. And so what we do is then we simply scan source drain voltages and gate voltages. So these two parameters which you have, and we measure conductance, differential conductance, and the differential conductance we plot in a color code uh, on a map like this. And depending on, uh, on your readout dot, this thing will look more or less complicated. So for people who know quantum dot, you see a column diamonds, you see contour ridges, you see a lot. We don't care about this. Huh? We, what we want is something stable. For example, this region here is not very stable. If you, if you know quantum dots here, there's some jumping going on. Uh, if you look here, some lines are also charge jumps. You don't like this. What you want is a nice, stable working point. That means we stabilize our device here, for example, at the border between no conductance, which is blue, and white or red. So here, somewhere in this border, we stabilize the device, and that's it. Uh, we, we, we just fix source and drain. Source Source and drain, we always put down to zero. Huh? So we don't want to inject uh, uh, currents too, uh, too strongly through the device because you will see the effect. And uh, so this we make as small as possible. And then we change the gate until we see a nice uh, sensitive point. So we use the, the, the quantum dot as a sensor. And once we have this sensor, then we want to, inter uh, we want to do something with our a magnetic system. So we simply apply a magnetic field and we scan this. So here we measure the conductance and uh, at a certain working point and I scan this as a function of the byte field. So you see then a certain behavior. So this behavior again can be very complicated depending on your quantum dot. So this uh, all I skip uh, and in this behavior you can find out if you have exchange coupling to your spin, which you want to read out and so on. So there's a lot of information hidden. But for this talk, the only thing which we need is that at a certain point, the big spin is reversing. And when the big spin is reversing, due to this small coupling to the quantum dot, sorry, uh, uh, the energy uh, should shift a bit. And the energy shifts a bit. This means uh, when you have a certain working point here, uh, the conductance becomes either higher or smaller. So you get a small jump. So this jump is the important thing. And in the following, I have to show you that these jumps here are really coming from the terbium spin. 
And why are these chumps? We read out the nuclear spin. Uh, so now I skip a lot of details, but the important thing are these small chumps. So before I can show you real measurements, again, I would like to show you the Seaman diagram. So we said we have an, uh, an electronic spin up or down. So this is the energy levels of these up and down spin as a function of a field. So if your spin is in this state and you scan now the field from the left to the right, here at zero field, exactly zero field, you can tunnel from this state to this state uh, because there's some tunnel splitting, there's some avoided level crossing. So this is for an isolated terbium spin without nuclear spin. Now if I switch on now the hyperfine coupling and you look exactly at this crossing, then you see what happens. So then this crossing is splitting off to four different uh, fields. And depending on uh, if my electronic spin is now tunneling here, then my nuclear spin is in this state. If it tunnels here, then the nuclear spin is here. So just by measuring at what field my <laughs> nuclear spin, my electronic spin is reversing, I know the nuclear spin state. Uh, so, so this is the, uh, the important trick we, we do. Uh, we just measure as fast as possible the tunneling of the big spin and depending on where it can tunnel, we know the small spin. So this is our readout method and everything in the following is based always on this small trick. Uh, the other Cupid guys, they have spin to charge conversion tricks. So here we don't have, we don't use spin to charge conversion. We just uh, uh, tunnel electronic spins with some magnetic anisotropy. Okay, so now uh, let's like, look at real measurements. Now again, I said I put this system at a certain working point. I measure the differential conductance and I scan my field. So if I do this and I, everything is set up, well, I see here, for example, a small jump. And then I have to repeat this many times. And when I do this many times uh, and everything is fine, then I will find out that I only have four different fields where the big spin can reverse. Uh, so I just made, measured many times, I made histograms, and you see the histograms are well separate. So I know exactly when I measure my system, it's in one of these states. What happens between measurements, I don't know. Huh? But when I measure it, uh, I know where this nuclear spin is. So this is the, the first thing. Now, yes? What percentage of the time do you get the, the, the spin transition when you, when you sweep? So, uh, so this is a tricky question in the sense that normally you have something which is called lambda zener probabilities, uh, which will depend on how fast you scan your applied field. Due to the interaction of the electronic spin with our quantum dot, we found out that the, the electronic spin is most of the time tunneling. So it's more than 90% of uh, the cases where we sweep, the electronic spin is tunneling. So this is a, is a, a separate paper, it would take uh, more than 20 minutes to explain this in detail all these interactions with the quantum dot. But uh, luckily for us it helps. That means most of the time the, no, the, the electronic spin is tunneling. So uh, we, we have very rarely, when we scan here, we see nothing. Uh, sometimes it would happen that you scan here, the electronic spin is not tunneling, and so we didn't measure our nuclear spin. So this could happen, but 90% uh, of the cases, this is not the case. And these measurements, uh, I think the student took out here. Otherwise, you would have seen here a straight line. Huh? <coughs> Very good question. Um, now, we want to make quantum operations. So the first step of any quantum operation is always that you have to initialize your system. Uh, we have to put it in a controlled state. So if you have an assembly of qubits, this initialization is a, a problem. It's not as easy. That's why nuclear spin uh, qubit... Uh, uh, um, quantum computing has a, on, on assemblies is uh, somewhere limited uh, because you have troubles to initialize all these nuclear spins in one state. So in our case, when you have one system, it's trivial. You measure a quantum system. When I measure it, it's in one of these states. Uh, it can't be in between a state. When I measure a quantum system, it's always projected to, uh, to uh, a certain fixed state. So I simply have to measure my quantum system and then I know where it is. And then I can make, as you see, some operation. So experimentally what we do is we scan the field up and down as fast as possible. And we measure always these small steps. 
uh, these jumps. Uh, and then here, for example, I just put points for each jump I measured. I put points as a function of time. Well, you see this scattering. But if you look uh, more carefully, you see that these scatterings are in these uh, bands. This is made our histogram. Uh, and if I connect, these, connect uh, these points, well, I see how the nuclear spin is wandering around uh, these four states uh, in the condition of always sweeping back and forth. So you see here, for example, it stayed a long time in one of these states. So then you do this over days, and you measure always the dwell time. So the time you stay in a certain state, this is the dwell time. You measure this, and you make statistics of this for all states. And then you integrate uh, the histograms, uh, the, what you find from these 12 times, and then this gives you the probability uh, uh, to uh, jump from one state to the other. So this is called T1. So when you fit this, we get the T1 of this level or the other levels. So here, at that stage, you can ask the question. Huh? So here you see that the T1 uh, is 10 seconds. So this means my nuclear spin at low temperature, he can stay in one state during 10 seconds in the mean. So is this long or is it short? And here's the question of, uh, of uh, 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 the guy here who is now reading emails. <laughs> uh, if, if the, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I always have excuses. So, uh, so that's why, I, that's why I woke you up. Um, so this, this, this thing here would be 1,000 seconds when the molecule would be in a nice environment, meaning if the chemist would make a nice crystal, molecular crystal of things, which is diluted, but most of the molecules would not be magnetic, just one, some of them, then this would be 1,000 seconds. The fact that I put this in a device, uh, this is uh, 100 times shorter, and depending on how much current I send through my device, I can make this even shorter. And we can make it a little bit longer, but we always have somewhere this factor of 100, which we have to pay as soon as we measure our quantum device. So, so the T1 is already limited. On the T2, you will see also a certain effect at a certain point. But uh, the first signation, uh, signature is on the T1. And this is, for example, discussed here. Um, I won't discuss this in more details. We want to come to quantum operations. So now we initialize our system. We have to manipulate now our quantum system from one state to the other. And uh, so if you do this with a spin, uh, most of the time uh, when you do this first with an NMR, for example, uh, you have a spin in a certain direction. You apply a transverse field, which is, which is uh, changing at the frequency of the energy you want to, uh, of, the, of, the, of the two levels which you have to want to to, uh, um, to manipulate. And uh, this uh, amplitude of the transverse field must be quite long, uh, quite large. So you apply uh, this AC field on, uh, on the spin, and then you can manipulate it. But as I said, the amplitude must be large, and all the single molecule devices or, uh, or the semiconducting qubit devices have somewhere there the bottleneck, because it's not easy to have uh, large amplitudes, meaning a fast manipulation of my spin, uh, and putting this local on a spin without getting artifacts. So that's why we use a trick here. We, we want to apply an electric, electric field. An electric field uh, you can apply very easily locally. We have our source and drain electrode, we have our gate. Uh, so we can apply electric fields very easily, and we can make them AC as well. But now we, our spin, our nuclear spin, should somehow talk to this electric field. And this uh, we do here via the Stark effect, meaning that we tune the hyperfine constant with the electric field. So if you tune the hyperfine constant, you will find out that it's very easy to manipulate a magnetic nuclear spin. And this is because if you go through the math, if I change the hyperfine constant A by uh, something like 10 to minus 4, and I convert this to an effective B field, I find that uh, I get values of the order of 100 millitesla. And this is a value which starts to be interesting if you want to manipulate quickly nuclear spins. Uh, nuclear spins are very small, so we need uh, high fields. So this, this you can achieve very easily with one millivolt 
per nanometer. Huh? So in the junction, this is trivial. It's very easy to, to get. So why are tuning some parameter? The chemist has more tricks. Huh? I can uh, put other stuff inside where in the end you get Stark effect. So Stark effect is here the, the important tool. And this we, we're going to use. Now all manipulations which I'm going to show you in the following will have three steps. The first step you have seen. We initialize our system. So then, uh, for example, we initialize it in three half. Then, in the next step, we have to make a, a apply a pulse. So a microwave pulse can have an amplitude, can have a frequency, can have a duration. It can have, you can apply different pulses. Uh, you can take different frequencies. Here you can make something very complicated. In the following, I will first some, do something very simple. And then I will make this more and more complicated. So always this step will be uh, the manipulation. And as I said, here we can apply fancy pulses, depending on uh, what ideas you have. And then in the third step, you have to read out our, your quantum system. And when you read it out, in the end, you can have, uh, in our case, uh, only four outcomes. Huh? In this, for a simple pulse here, you will get either uh, the, um, this state, or this one. If the pulse is more complicated, you will get one of the four states. But if you measured your quantum system once, uh, you, you initialized it, you manipulated it, and you measured it once, you can't say anything else. Uh, you can't say any, uh, you, it's just one realization. So in order to say something, what you have to do, you have to make many measurements of the same sequence. And then you get the probability to find your system in a certain state. state. So what we do is we measure in the end probabilities. So this sequence we do uh, as fast as possible many times for a given uh, microwave pulse. So we always repeat this. Is, we uh, measure the probabilities in the end and, uh, and, then, and then we plot this. Is this okay? Yes? So the pulse you're applying to the source drain bias or to the gate? So, uh, so this again is a tricky question. Um, we can apply easily static uh, electric fields via the gate. This is easy to control. If you send a microwave pulse on uh, three electrodes, uh, what really happens local to the molecule is not easy to predict. So it can be a combined effect gate and source and train. I think it's source and train because source and train is much closer than the gate. Gate is something more global, it's at a distance of uh, about 10 nanometers. Uh, we have these, uh, these isol insulators between uh, source and train. Uh, so I think it's source and train which is doing it, but we have no proof. And we don't care too much because we just have to get a local electric field uh, on the molecule, and there will be always a transverse component and a longitudinal component, and for the moment we, com we, we care most about the transverse one. And uh, yeah, so... <coughs> yes? So are, you, so are you launching the power then through the source and drain? Or then we... we external source that you're trying to... So we irradiate uh, simply the device with some kind of antenna, and this is captured by a source and train, and it uh, puts this very local on the molecule. And the only thing you have to be careful is not to send too much power, otherwise your system will blow out or your molecule will move out. Um, so this again, uh, the, the real geometry is something which we don't control at that stage, but we don't care too much, it works all the time. Once you're at that stage, it works. Um, deficiency in the end is something else. Huh? So if you think about uh, real quantum computing, uh, then it's something more complicated. So in the following, I want to show you some manipulations, and we'll start very simple. So very simple means I just apply one pulse, there's a given frequency, a given length, uh, and a, a certain power. And the power which I can plot is only the power outside of the fridge. It has nothing to do with the power really in the fridge. Uh, and, but the, the measurement will tell us the effective B-field which will uh, generate this power. And I will plot first the data of the first student who did this, uh, Stefan Thiele, in order to honor it, uh, honor his first measurements, and then I will show you better measurements. So what we do is we plot the visibility. The visibility is another word just to say the probability to find my system in one of these states. Uh, so this is uh, how visible so we start to have our system in the ground state, so this means zero. Uh, and then uh, 
to get the system uh, to the other state would be one on the other side. And so then we, may, may, we apply pulses longer and longer. So if you do this now, for each point, you made the whole sequence many times. Huh? So for each length of the pulse, you measure uh, many times the probability uh, to find the system in one of these states after the pulse. And then you see that these probabilities are oscillating. And these oscillations are called Rabi oscillations. And these Rabi oscillations will depend on the power. So if I change the power, uh, it will oscillate faster. Uh, you can check this then, it should be some, uh, some kind of linear behavior. So this was the first time we did this with Stefan. Uh, then a second student continued these, uh, these kind of uh, studies, uh, Clemo, and he did this much better. So, so uh, yeah, well, he started uh, this new um, this, uh, three years of time, so, so uh, he could then uh, optimize the sequences and so on. Uh, so he got much nicer Rabi oscillations. Before I come to the next step, I want to tell you very quickly also that uh, we don't have only the AC Stark effect, but also the DC Stark effect, meaning that for a given gate, so this is my gate voltage, for example, I get a resonance of my system at this frequency. If I change my gate, I see that, uh, so I change the gate a certain amount, I see that this frequency is shifting. The amplitude is changing as well, that's why uh, this becomes larger. But uh, what you see is that with gates, we can tune resonance frequencies. So this is a very important tool which we'll need as soon as uh, we play with more than one nuclear spin. We have to tune resonance frequencies. So, we want to come here. Huh? So, how long uh, we can store an information in this system? So this is... Uh, called the Ramsey uh, experiment. So what you do is simply you initialize your system in a certain state. You apply a pi over 2 pulse. This brings your system in a superposition. And then the question is how long this superposition state can live before uh, it's defaced. So we simply wait a certain time. And then we make another pi over 2 pulse. If we then find the system in the other state, uh, so pi over 2 plus pi over 2 is uh, a pi pulse. So if you find the system then when you measure it in the other state, this means during the waiting time nothing happened. If you find here a random outcome, uh, either up and down or randomly, this means during this waiting time my system was defaced. So I simply have to measure uh, the outcome as a function of waiting, waiting time. And this is Ramsey. So if you do this uh, here for the first measurements, you get a T2, uh, so you get oscillations, and then the decay of these oscillations uh, giving you T2 star, and this was of this order. Uh, Clément did this much better. Uh, so we are at T2 times of, of about 300 uh, microseconds, uh, and uh, he did this also for all uh, three colors. That means all these three levels. Uh, here you see the resonance frequencies, and uh, for sp I will skip this now, so here is spin echo. Uh, so the T2 is then a little bit longer, get rid of some dephasing. The important thing is now, in this time of T2, how many operations I can do. And this is called the quality factor. So what I have to see is uh, this time here, to make a pi over 2 pulse, or uh, this is, I have to divide uh, this number by this time, and then this gives you a quality factor. And for our systems, we can make, in principle, uh, 10,000 pulses before we lose the quantum phase. So this means uh, it's interesting, our system, <coughs> to start to make more complicated stuff. And this I try to do in the last 10 minutes. Uh, so now, now it becomes complicated. Uh, sorry for that. Um, so what's a quantum operation? So in fact, a quantum operation, uh, it's a fancy way uh, of saying unitary transformation. So in quantum mechanics, you just have a certain state, basic state, and then you make a unitary transformation of this basic state to another state, and this you call quantum operation. Uh, so it's just a unitary transformation of my states. Now the important thing in these 
after unitary transformation are the state populations. So the state populations I plotted. Huh? I just plotted the probability to find the system in one state or the other state. These are the state populations. But the more important thing are the phases. So the probabilities is one thing, but we want the quantum phases. So after each unitary transformation, uh, the important information is inside the quantum phase. And this quantum phase I have to measure with some means. And this is the tricky part. And uh, now, in order to do this, in optics, for you, this is very familiar. Uh, in optics, you take a laser with a nice face. You make a beam, spl beam splitter. So this you call then the reference signal. And the other part of your laser, you deface via medium. This gives you a certain defacing. And then you interfere them again. And uh, this interference tells you something about this face. Uh, so in optics, this is trivial. Uh, this you know very well. Now how I can do this with a nuclear spin? So a nuclear spin, uh, when you see this the first time, it looks a little bit fancy. So here I do this for three levels. So having a nice laser, meaning I put my system in one of these states. So here I'm happy. So here is my, my starting point. Now when I make a pi over two pulse, I split off my laser. So I have here my reference part. And this is now my superposition state, which uh, I want uh, to uh, use to probe something or do something. Uh, so for a laser, I would then send this uh, beam into the medium, and this will deface. Now in my case, I want to make a game. So I take another frequency, meaning that with another frequency, I, go, I can go from red to blue, uh, to, to green. So I've got to make a pi pulse. So I put this superposition here in this, this state. When I go down, I add a phase. And uh, then, in order to see that I added here a phase, I have to interfere them again. Uh, uh, and then I see uh, if uh, this worked as I wanted. Uh, so it's like uh, in the laser, uh, we add here a phase, and then in the end, we have to find out the phase here. And this I'm going to do now in the following. So here, I did this in a very simple way. Uh, I started at this point, I split off the beam, here I go up, when I go down, I add a phase, which I call theta. And then in order to probe what theta I added, I make here another pi over two pulse between the result, where I added a phi. And this phi phase uh, can then compensate the theta phase. And so what I have to do is then I have to plot the probability to find my system in this state, simply as a function of theta and phi, and then I get this map. And if I have here a line like this, this means I compensated the, the theta phase with then the phi phase, and this works. So what I see here is I, I see a, a cosine a theta plus phi over two interference. So when I see this, I say, OK, this manipulation worked well. Now I can make it more complicated. I can say now I go up here with pi, another pi to this level. When I go down, each time I add a theta. Theta here, theta here, and then interfere this. So then I get 2 theta plus phi over 2 interference. So I see here 2 times the, the, uh, the fringes which I see here. Or here I make another game, or the student did another game, where he added here a theta 3 and here a theta 1, and then I get the theta 3 over 2 interference. So this is to test your qubit or you, you did. Uh, it's just adding phases and trying to remeasure the phases. So now, when you make a real gate. A real gate, uh, you have some unitary transformation, which you can put in a matrix. Uh, so this is a unitary transformation for a two-qubit system. If I take a, a, this and I map this on a four-level system, I can map a four-level system on a two-qubit uh, system this way. Uh, and if I look at this matrix, I have an I swap gate. Uh, so I swap two qubits, and I, I multiply each state with a phi factor, uh, an I factor. So this is I swap gate. Well, it's just a gate. So if you now uh, look what this I swap gate is in the basis of a four-level system, so this corresponds to a three pi pulse between these two levels. And when you make this mapping. And if you measure this now, well, you will see uh, these are the state populations uh, with the different colors. 
you see then that when I apply uh, a pulse, which is uh, with a frequency which matches these two levels, and then a certain length, well, I make this manipulation, and now a 3 pi pulse would be a pulse which is 3 pi long, so it would be a manipulation until to this state. Now here you will tell me, well, oh, you're cheating here. What you plot here is Rabi oscillation between these two levels. Uh, this, these are Rabi oscillations between two, these two levels. Uh, so uh, what's, what, what are you doing here? Well, in fact, what I have to prove in the following to you is that when I make Rabi oscillations between these two levels, this state and this state is different. Uh, in terms of state population, this is the same like this. Huh? It's always here, everything is in green. Um, so in terms of state populations, it's the same. But here I have 2 pi more. So 2 pi more, most of the time it's cancelled. So, so I have to prove now in the following that this, is, this, this manipulation up to here or to here is different. In order to do this, I have to implement my I swap gate into some more complicated uh, manipulation. And this is shown here. So I have to make all this sequence. And in this sequence, you see that here I have a pi pulse. Uh, so, and here I have a 3 pi pulse. So here is my I swap. And depending if I put here a pi or 3 pi, the outcome is different. Because if you look at what happens, if I put here pi, then I end up in the blue state. So here. That means in the final end, I put my population in this state. But if I put here 3 pi, then the green state comes up. So this shows you that pi or 3 pi is not the same. That's why I swap gate is interesting somewhere. Uh, you add really a phase. And now experimentally, we have to prove this now. So experimentally, this looks more noisy. But if you look carefully, you see that here we get the blue state up. And here we get the green state up. So this works. So now we have two minutes left to show you more complicated stuff. Uh, so, uh, so all this is some training to come to more and more complicated uh, quantum operations. And uh, one of uh, the initial motivation was that he wanted to show that this proposal here, uh, nearly 20 years old, that this proposal can be realized in a, in a real spin system. Uh, so this was uh, the initial motivation, and we needed nearly 20 years to do this. Huh? So, um, so this is here they proposed the Grove algorithm. Grove algorithm is another uh, algorithm uh, which, which can do something with, with quantum states. So in the end, what you do in Grover is that you, you say that you have a, a, a base, a quantum base with different states, and you would like to search a certain state in your base. Huh? Uh, 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 and so this is the Grover algorithm. So in our case, for for uh, for uh, four levels, this means that that we we want to encode in uh, in a certain uh, uh, in these four levels. We want to encode uh, uh, a certain information, which then in the end we can read out again by selecting again this state. So uh, so this was the initial uh, motivation of uh, of Clemo and uh, of his thesis. And so he needed, in the end, <laughs> three years to find three states in these quantum bases. <laughs> uh, so not very sufficient, uh, um, efficient. So I don't have too much time to show you this in the, de in the, in the beginning uh, in detail. But what you have to do is you have to make first an Hadamard gate. And Hadamard gate is another way to say that you have a superposition state between uh, two states. Or here, between four states, you have to make a superposition state between four states. And uh, at the beginning, uh, the Grover algorithm didn't work because Clemmer made the wrong superposition state. Uh, so he, he made some states where the phases of each of these states were not controlled. And so he thought about only state populations, and then he couldn't find again the states. So he needed uh, quite some time to find this mistake because theorists, they always can put phases to zero. Uh, an experimentalist has to be more careful. So here it's the, uh, it's the right measurement of an Hadamard gate, which, uh, which makes a superposition state of three states, where the phases are all initialized to zero. And from this state, so uh, a certain pulse, which you have to calculate first on a classical computer, and then send this on your, your uh, QDIT, here you have the right preparation to make then the Grover pulse. And so, so his game was 
from this mixture find out each of these three colors. Uh, so the green color he, he could uh, take out quite easily. Uh, so he yeah, was happy this works. The red one uh, worked uh, a little bit more difficult. And the black, he needed quite some time to get it out. Uh, so uh, to select here from this mixture, the black one. Uh, so I uh, can't tell you the details, but, but this was more complicated was because experimentally you're always limited with some uh, microwave generators. Uh, so uh, there were some, some difficulties. So all this to tell you that we play with uh, single nuclear spins. We can do some games. I did this for, for one system only. Uh, uh, we do this, uh, or we try to do this on other stuff as well. I couldn't show you this. There are some groups in the world who are doing similar stuff. I didn't show you this here, but I showed you re uh, references in the beginning where you find these groups. And uh, I want to tell you very quickly what we do nowadays. For example, we, we have here two terbium 3 plus ions with two nuclear spins. And then we want to talk to this system. Uh, and if you look at the same diagram of this guy, you see immediately this becomes more complicated. Uh, and you have more frequencies. You get problems like frequency crowding. That means frequencies which are very close, which gives you troubles. But well, we work on this. Another important thing where we work on, and there are two students here who showed you a poster, and you might have seen this poster, is that we want to uh, read out these systems in other ways. For example, optically. So uh, we want to use quantum emitters, which can be ligands or some other attached ligands, to read out uh, uh, the spin systems here. And then we want to use our tools uh, of source and train, electrodes, uh, and RF uh, antennas, and so on, to uh, make more complicated games in the future. I have to thank different students, and mainly these uh, Clément Godfrain, uh, who made most of the measurements I showed you. Stefan Thiel is here. These are my students over 10 years. Huh? So it's uh, in France, you don't have too many students at the same time. Uh, we have a lot of chemistry collaborations. I only showed you one molecule coming from Maria Huben, but uh, I studied more than, uh, I stopped counting after 600 systems. Uh, so we, we studied a lot of uh, stuff here, a lot of physics around. We have now in, in Karlsruhe a new group. And here are um, uh, the important group members uh, of my new group. And uh, they are working on different uh, uh, things. And I hope to continue the stuff soon. Uh, here you see our fridges. We build our fridges ourselves. Uh, so these are tabletop fridges. So going down to low temperature is not very complicated. You just need this small pot. And then you can cool down. And I would like to thank you for your attention.